gotten older and I've had kids it's given me a brand new appreciation for these small pockets of time right Franco where oh, it's like yeah. this is where I get to work this is where I get to like get some stuff done during the day and like wow I have all these goals all these things we want to accomplish and it's like wow finally like uh, get to do it but anyway I just want to welcome you Franco uh, to the show it's a genuine pleasure to have you I mean all the credit frankly goes to you for reaching out with one of the great subject lines that one could hope to receive. I love what you stand for. <laughs> so first yeah. of all, that legitimately made not only my week, but my month. It was extremely generous of you. And you shared some of the work uh, that you've been, you've been doing, which I thought was, was really extraordinary. I think where I want to start is sure. the place that I think we definitely click 1000%. And that is the incredibly undersold topic of the therapeutic application of tabletop. And I think 100%. for me, we really, really want to unpack that with Story Together. But you, I think, have just done such a beautiful and elegant job of doing it with Tranquility and Abducted. So where I want to start, Franco, is just talk about a little bit about you know your, your company, your organization, kind of where you're going. And then I'd love to hear what went into it from a therapeutic standpoint? Like what inspired you to create something so beautiful? Because obviously that came from the heart. Like you open it up in like three minutes and you're like, whoa, this this is a guy who gets it, you know? So I'd love to hear more about that and just see where we go. Yeah, that's that's great. It's a great place to start. Uh, you mentioned company. This is just something I do as a hobby. Uh, these are all up for oh, free. Oh, no, making money. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Company, I guess. Yeah, it's just under under my name. I found itch.io, and I've been uploading ever since. But yeah, I've I've always since I was like in elementary school found myself just writing, sure. sci-fi writing, fantasy, like just right. straight from my head, and that's just something that uh, has just always come to me. I loved writing, loved creating worlds, loved creating stories, right. and with these journaling games these like tabletop rpg solo journeys yep. it's it's kind of a mixture of how people use journals it, on the regular basis you know to like a diary or something to to put right. their feelings into it uh and i feel like a lot of people they don't give themselves enough credit they don't think they're creative enough or mm. they don't think it's the outlet for them and i think either having prompts or a topic that they resonate like sci-fi or fantasy or just some sort of escapism kind of right. op opens that door a little bit and makes it easier exactly. to get in and it's like all right like here's the the appetizer here's the welcome mat you know the the stepping stone for you to start putting pen to paper and kind of create a story that's guided but it's uniquely yours and exactly. then it lets you kind of look in and be like okay like he's setting a path for me here but this is going to be my story or, you know, whether it's luck or if you want to take it like in, in the abducted one, you can choose, you know, to have it be luck or choose your own path as you go down along the way. And I just hope that it, it would help people open up, you know, and putting some feelings down to paper and, and exploring something that they might not have thought was there. I mean, I, I completely agree. You know what it kind of reminded me of, and this is a crappy analogy, but I'm just going to say it. <laughs> Do it. It's like the exact antithesis of the Tom Riddle journal in Harry Potter. Like, Ooh. something that will, like, literally help, like, is there to, like, low-key help you and give you feedback mm -hmm. as you're, you know, kind of meeting these sort of important story beats, but also feelings, whether you are aware of them or not. I think it can help harden you and strengthen you. But I think awareness is such a key aspect because it's really hard to act on something consciously if you're not aware of it. And yeah. what, you, what you do a really good job of in tranquility, obviously abducted too, is is give the, 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 the journaling player awareness, but without making it like label and just like slamming it on them, but really just say, uh, like that's why I think tranquility is so beautiful is because mm -hmm. you're on the open ocean, you're on the water, and it's just such a great context for facing that type of fear or feeling head on without it being like having all this pressure or baggage and I just thought it was such a wonderful illustration of the power of that so um, Frank I, I wanted to ask you so what 
what was the main source of inspiration for these settings? Because Abducted and Tranquility, and I know that you have more coming down the pipeline as well, are just really unique, interesting settings for this solo journaling um, that you've done. I, I'm not, I don't know, I'm no expert of whether you've pioneered, but you're definitely one of the greatest applications that I've ever personally read. So what was the inspiration for going the solo route? Um, is it more from a player agency and empowerment graduate to other systems? Or is it really just like, listen, this is about you and that's okay. Like what was, where did that stem from, from you in your life? Yeah. The, the solo aspect comes from, I guess these, the immersion that comes with these worlds, it's, mm. it's so powerful sometimes and you, you just want to get in there sometimes. And one of the hardest things that people find, especially now with like yeah. virtual world and meeting, not meeting up with people, you know, face to face is, finding a group sometimes to play with. If you're moving around a lot, I've, I've moved around in the past couple of years and I haven't been able to like find a group of people consistently right. in the local area. But something fun to do uh, on your own is huge. Uh, and I thought that that's something that people uh, really enjoy. Um, mm. I'm big into board games now too. And a lot of what I've found is a lot of board games are typically two to four, but recently in the last five years, they are one to five players. They include oh, yeah, like yeah. a solo variant. So it's become very popular. Um, I don't think it's a bad thing per se. It just lets people kind of enjoy something on their own. Uh, so that's, that's kind of my reasoning for going solo there. Um, and the inspiration, again, like you said, two very different things. One's mm. something that I find myself thinking a lot about is like space exploration and either the fear or mystery of space. Um, and the open ocean one is just kind of that feeling whenever you're on a boat or on a cruise ship. If you ever just sit on the veranda and look out into the distance and you just like feel consumed by it, mm. it's beautiful but extremely terrifying at the same time. And I mm. feel like both of those things are in tranquility, as you may have seen in, in kind of what I try to capture there. No, I mean, I love the sort of layered like horizon metaphors of, of being on the deck. And being around mm -hmm. like in a therapeutic setting i think that would come it would take longer i think to arrive at sort of the puzzle piece that your brain is able to consume and that's why i think that what you've designed is so brilliant is because the brain will be able to consume those not lessons but that that metaphorical imagery and learning i think and process it faster and I, you know that's one of the reasons why i've been so vocal about the therapeutic application is because mm -hmm. we're i think humans are very story driven creatures i think that's pretty evident and I think being able to use sort of the enzyme of story, we can digest that in you know, much more nuanced and elegant and sophisticated ways quicker. Yeah. We just can. Like, think about your favorite stories, your favorite movies or video games or whatever it is. Like, when you're done, you've been consumed by it. Like, it's almost like you Thanos the thing into your own mind's gauntlet, right? And I've talked about another. Interview. Yeah, Very yeah. Very much like that for me. Yep, it's it's all down to like immersion, and you go through it. You know, you you feel these feelings, whether it's a video game, a board game, or a tabletop game. You, uh, the level with which you open up and like become that thing that you're either role playing as or writing as, it just opens up and you connect to it. And it's like, right. I guess like a fraction of you. You know, it might not be all of you in a moment, but it's like you're focusing in on one piece and hashing it out a little bit because there's so much going on in your mind 24 7 you know you're thinking of work like you said family all these yep. things you know you don't have time to stop and be like you know what like this might be why i'm angry or why i'm feeling sad mm. and then you kind of like go down that hole a little bit and you're like okay like you start figuring it out and the more you understand i think the more you can either cope with it or move forward or kind of focus in and learn on what you need to grow on so it's always it's always important yeah, so let me ask you, um, a lot of the creators that I've talked to, even myself, it, it, while it obviously I think does come from like an altruistic standpoint, like I want to use stories to help people, that sort of thing, I think yours is very explicitly about helping people. Was there something that happened in your life where you've experienced, like you, I think you said, you know, all this sort of natural world building in your head? I think that's a lot of something that's... GMs, you know, like we have, like I grew up being like, oh, that's totally normal. Everyone has stories playing in their head, like movies mm -hmm. all the time. It's like totally fine. Um, but no, that's not necessarily normal. You had that. So was there a sort of an inflection point in your life that said, this is what I want to do explicitly for other people? Because when you read Tranquility, you're abducted or really, and even in just your emails, you can tell that that just kind of radiates off you. What, 
where did that come from in your life and you're sort of at your evolution? I don't, I don't think it's, and, and I've had this come up before where people will bring a comment similar to that. It's like, okay, there's a lot of stuff going on here. And to be honest, like nothing has happened to me where it's like, wow, I need, you know, like, like someone goes through like a traumatic, a traumatic event or something. Right. And they're like, I need to do anything and everything in my power to not have it happen to someone else. Mm-hmm. I feel mm-hmm. like it's, the opposite i see it happening all around me all the time right and i consider myself extremely lucky with things and it's it, it, it's almost like it, of course problems happen but nothing to the point where you know it's 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 brought me down to a point where it's like okay that's only up from here you know it, it's i've been very middle ground my entire life but i've seen people like in my family and friends mm. and I guess there's like a level of empathy there where it's like, Ooh, that's not good. And I just kind of like absorb all these things from all Mm. these people that I try and talk to. Uh, And, you know, at trying to help as much as I can, I guess that's, that's just part of it. I I find people in my family resort to me to talk to just because I'll absorb what they're trying to say. And you're talking about these therapeutic things and, in a Hispanic culture, I'm Hispanic. Uh, it's it's very much uh, something you don't do. You don't talk about mm. your feelings and stuff. But people have found themselves talking to me, and and they're like, "Oh, this guy's like listening. Like he's not trying <laughs> to, you know, uh, have me finish talking so that he can get to his point. He's listening, absorbing what I'm saying. So like I'll absorb these things, and there's right. a lot of emotions building up over time. And it's like, okay, like people, I think need something to turn to i'm not saying they shouldn't turn to me i'm I'm super happy to talk to anybody all the time but it's something that i found would be like you know what this would be nice uh based on the people i've met in my life so it's not a me thing it's a everybody else type thing and i kind of see what's going on and some people are better at kind of coping than others and right. i think more tools in the world uh it wouldn't hurt <laughs> No, I mean, I, I completely agree with you. And, you know, for some, it, it can be a traumatic experience. I mean, mm-hmm. I'd say for me, when I was much younger, you know, unfortunately, I was diagnosed with cancer. It spread to my lymph nodes. So I was 17. So that was a traumatic event. I wouldn't necessarily say, though, that, I mean, that definitely had something. But I think what you said is really, really interesting because you are a naturally empathetic person who cares about other people that can observe. And I think the most underrated quality in any human being is the capacity to listen. I'm not just with your ears. I'm talking about listening with your heart and actually sort of compartmentalize what they're saying. Um, It's almost like you realized really early on that you could intake that and excrete it in story form in a way that can help. And I think that skill set is ridiculously important for our collective future. And I, I know that's like kind of a grandiose statement, but the reason why I think that is if you kind of examine, I think you've probably done some sort of similar mental gymnastics that I'm about to do, where um, it seems like we're in this huge divide in society, mm-hmm. stratification, understanding, connection. The real secret to bring people together is through a shared story experience. Right. Which the connective tissue of which, like I think you really wonderfully pointed out is empathy. Right. Yep. There's no other game in town. Like that's the only way this is going to work. And I think products like yours are such a wonderful avenue to doing that. Um, and when I read, them, I was like, I, I have to talk to this guy. If I don't talk to this guy, he's going to get a lot of emails from me until he agrees to. <laughs> that's a fact. <laughs> that's hilarious. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm glad you reached out uh you know it's sometimes you just shoot emails into the ether and it's like they, they might not care about this stuff you know but i it was a vibe you know i'm like this guy's doing something right here uh let me let me reach out hey man i'm trying i think you just have to you have to care and put a stake in the ground of the things that you care about and you're willing to fight for right 100 percent. Um, i'd love to hear more from you franco about obviously I think we've talked about where you've been, but I'd love to talk more about where, where you're going. We shared a little bit over email, but I'd love to really dig into that. Uh, and, and I know that you talked to like your followers are super into it. I'd love to kind of dig more into that. Cause when I read like the couple of sentences, I'm like, Whoa, this could be super cool. Yeah. It's, it's something that I was talking to my brother's fiance and in that, that age group. So that you were asking for ages early. I'm 28. So I'm kind mm-hmm. of, you know, 
about to hit my 30, so I'm not a, uh, in, in the lower 20s, but she's a little bit younger and a very popular game series, uh, Animal Crossing, which I think yeah, sure. feeds hugely into like this whole therapeutic thing where people 100%. want to just escape a little bit and be in a little town and have low stakes and yep. grow a farm and just have some friends. And I don't know if it exists yet, but I was like, you know what? I'm pretty experienced in the TTRPG space. There's all these fantasy fighting things and solo journaling things. And I was like, what if there's just like a low stakes little town that you get to run and kind of develop as you go so that's been a little bit of a challenge in trying to like translate it into mm. like a little journal or pdf style game and i think there's some good stuff uh going on there uh at night i find myself just that's when all the ideas come to me i'm like thinking of right. There has to be stakes, but lower stakes and what kind of things you can do so the classes are more like storytellers and bakers and farmers instead of like knights and sure. heroes and stuff like that. So there's still like a gameplay element to it that can be like solo or group based. And it's just that, like a little village thing. And when she heard me talking about that she's like you need to drop that like now uh she told me to send her like the preliminary rules she's like i need this now and it's like i don't know if there's like a need for that type of escapism but she's like i need it <laughs> like i want it now well listen i mean i think the ideal state is there probably isn't that need i think the reality is there's an extreme need for it right? yeah. <laughs> i think um I think about, you know, Stardew Valley, Animal Crossing, yeah. right? A, a, a solo sort of slightly fantastical uh, setting. I'm a huge sucker for base building, by the way. Oh, but it's like yeah. Low, but low stakes base building where you're developing the town. Like there's all these relationships and you find yourself and maybe there's like a, a cool little uh, mystery thread um, but then all of a sudden like you know through your efforts like the bakery has the dopest cinnamon rolls you know like yeah. that type of stuff I could see that being a absolutely massive success and obviously what you might want to consider is I know that like you know you're an expert in solo and you should definitely go there but it'd be really cool because I remember in Animal Crossing right don't they give you the ability to visit other people's um, villages, right? Yeah, they do. It'd be really interesting if you found a way, like in a virtual tabletop setting, to like visit other people's worlds, like because you have really, really good art in Abducted, in my opinion. I think Abducted. <laughs> I mean, we talked about that. I'm a sucker for eight bit. More things I'm a sucker for. Yeah. Like if you found a way to like somehow bring a a, a um, an aesthetic, a physical aesthetic reality in a virtual tabletop, people could visit what you've done. Then it's all of a sudden like you've layered people's development in their journey with their town in this fanta beautiful, fantastical setting with what others are doing with the same structure, but like, it could be totally different. Like, oh man, now you got my head going in a billion different directions. Yeah, yeah, you there's so many things. That's like, really cool, yeah. No, no, that that that's always, it's always fun to think about like, whoa, like how it could be, like stretch it, and it's like, how much of it turns into like a, like a video game eventually, and mm. it's like, I always find myself like, there's a balance in there's a, and there's also like a, a beauty in like keeping it simple i found oh, course, like yeah. the simplicity because it's like these journaling and like ttrpg games the, the it started because it was like all you need is a piece of paper a couple oh, yeah. dice maybe and stuff yep. like that so elevating it it's always super fun and stuff and it's like that's something that maybe so like i don't know like developers or something can like get into but i like that joint like here's my village here's your village and if there's ever people like when i publish the game that yep. like either in forums or something's like hey this is my version of this this is who lives here this is what they do this is what i've come across and have it be because there's like a character creation aspect of it too yep. and then it's like all right like they can you can i'm like i like that guy i'm gonna take that guy to my village or like do this and you there's little rules you know there's no wi-fi needed you just whatever you want to include or incorporate the rules are kind of up to you no that's great i mean obviously i think like most improv rpgs are where i got started as a kid right my brother and i you know just taking 2d6 which by the way is still my preference over d20 i'll fight anybody i'm kidding I love, <laughs> I'm, i love d20 i'm just messing i'm just messing but i did start with 2d6 yeah you know, nothing like rolling a 12 
Um, but you're right. I mean, you out of just a, you don't even need to paper half the time as long as yeah. like you're able to be cognizant. As long as you have the dice, you can just sit there and make anything up for 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 pretty much forever. And I, yeah. I I completely agree with you on that. So let me ask you. So right before we kind of hit record, you and I started to talk briefly about how you discovered this art form, right? Because evidently yeah. you've gotten this far in only a few years, which is ridiculous. Um, it's just an incredible achievement. But where I know, yes, you said you started with D and D, but like, how did you discover it? And then what were some of your first experiences like? And then what led you down the path that you're on now? Like, was there kind of a decision that you made? Like, this is where I want to go. Like, how did that work for you? Yeah. So my my now wife at the time girlfriend, she was a big podcast fiend, just devouring podcasts. This is around 2018. So it sounds like a long time ago, but like couple years ago you know right, right, right. Uh, she's all these comedy podcasts all these dark podcasts story podcasts and then she had heard someone talk about a D and D podcast and it was yep. not another D and D podcast so nad pod unsure yep. if, if you're familiar with them and she's like hey i think you'd like this i didn't know anything about D I d i didn't know wow. anything about ttrpgs nothing and this was in 2018 and i'm listening to these guys do this by listening to, they're comedians but mm -hmm. listening to them tell this story i'm like Man, this guy's just making – you can tell they're making it all up. I'm learning the rules as they go, and I'm like, we need to do this. Like, we need oh, to yeah. play this. And I have some friends who are, like, big into Lord of the Rings and big into, like, Magic the Gathering, another Wizards of the Coast product. And I'm huge on, like like I said, like, story building and just grabbing a setting and going with it. And I was like, guys, let's do it. And they were all down. So it's like, a group of five of us. We played online. And they were like, this was amazing. Like, we mm. need to keep doing this. Since then, we've been playing every weekend. And like, every single weekend. And to the point for where it got five to... Years? For five years? For five years. We've is... been playing. We've added people. Uh, and it got to two games. We're currently at two games right now. I'm going to wrap one up in the next two weeks. And we're going to start another one. And we have new people joining. Yeah, like you, it's, you're just you're just ripping five E basically. Five E, yeah. Uh, we were doing pre-written modules that I like to do, which sounds like the unpopular opinion, especially with how I'm talking about that I like writing stories and stuff. But it's not copy and paste. It's all right. This is the the starting point. It's like my prompt. This is my world. They like set Curse all the rules Strahd. up exactly. And then like riff. Yep, and we finished Curse of Strahd about nice. a month ago, actually, so that was pretty nice. nice. Um, and just go with it. Tailor it to the character's needs, though. You know, I get their backstories, mm. and it's not like, all right, that's going to be on the back burner now. No, I take all their families and all their NPCs, enemies, and I just mesh it into what exists to the point that it, like, overtakes what exists already. And then it's it. their game, not Curse of Strahd. It's their game with me guiding them through this and it's i've learned so much because like playing like i've had I have hundreds of games hundreds of hours oh sure so the first year was like wow i would have right now it's like looking back i would never do that in a game now because that doesn't work or like this is how my players think or this is what they want and they absolutely love it uh, uh i think if they rewatch this in the future they'd be like yeah i think we love it because we've met strangers through this and like we'll finish a campaign and you assume that they're like gonna go on their way and they kind of message you like hey when are we getting back, Get together. back together yeah, yeah. exactly <laughs> so we have I, I was talking to one of my friends now that i've made through this and he's like oh, of course yeah telling me his backstories and stuff he's like i'm so excited to get back into this like i know we wrapped up but like it's just part of his routine now and it's it's a way to open up and chat with people and the way that we do it i think is really neat too because it's it's their game we have found ourselves crying you know like with things that happen like game. yeah like uh, we had a character death and we talk about this all the time and like she sacrificed herself for the party and like everybody was just so in it that she just broke like they broke everybody broke down and it, it was yeah. just like a very intense moment and that's something that you can't you can't get anywhere else. You know, you could watch a movie and it's like you'll cry, but it wasn't something that was happening to you. You know, you weren't 
Oh no, you're bonded in a exactly. whole, di- whole different bond. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, bonded. it was crazy. Yeah, crazy. So just things you can't feel anywhere else, things you can't experience oh, anywhere else. Yeah. So there's a um, one of my personal sources of inspiration. Um, he was a college basketball coach, and he said, um, "If you can uh, laugh, cry, and think in a day, you've had a hell of a day." <laughs> yeah. Right, and there's no activity that I have ever come across like tabletop that allows you to do those three things within the span of like five minutes. <laughs> yeah, I <laughs> like agree. Tabletop, right, let alone a day. Oh my gosh! So I mean, if you're in five E and you've just been like absolutely crushing the Forgotten Realms, like give me some favorite moments like that are kind of like the. I mean, I'm. I don't so mean to put you on the spot in the sense that like there's so many, obviously, yeah. but I don't want what comes out of your mouth to be seen as like that's my favorite moment. Yeah. No pressure. Just like, what are some examples of moments that you can share that you would feel comfortable sharing anyway that you you have had or your players have had or like moments of revelation? Like, I'd love to like dig into that a little bit because that's such a great. So many. You hear like GMs when they come on this thing, you all of a sudden they just start like bubble. Like I bubble too. Like trust me. Like I'd yeah, love yeah. to hear more about that. Yeah, what, one of the best examples. It's it's the one I just mentioned. We were playing Descent into Avernus. Not mm. sure if you. Yep, yep. First layer hell, baby. Let's do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. So we're we're playing Descent into Avernus. We'd started the game. We're about like seventy percent of the way through, mm. and our uh, one of our friends that we met through this. Her name is uh, Haley. She's I think the youngest person, but also her character was the youngest character. She was like a teenage. Air Genasi, Genasi, mm-hmm. however it's pronounced, and the gift, she, gift debate. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> so she was. They were on their war machine going to Archon's tower. So mm-hmm. uh, the the Dragonborn dude down there that worships Tiamat. They were trying to steal this orb from him, and or like they had the orb and they were trying to trade it with him, but they ended up stealing everything and running away. She was on the war machine and they're driving. So it's Mad Max. Yeah, like okay. in hell yeah. so they're all driving yeah. there's a yeah. white yeah. dragon chasing them it's super high stakes i've learned as a dm that you can throw at them the hardest challenge and the players usually figure a way out of it that you weren't expecting so i always mm-hmm. challenge them so there's a white dragon archon's driving his thing right behind them she grabs his orb and it's like trying to distract them because he's attacking their car so she gets up on top and she's expecting to like get out of this unscathed she's getting a little cocky and he like teleports grabs her teleports away they don't see him or her the car turns around the dragon turns around and she wasn't expecting that the players weren't expecting that and i was messaging her separately because i'm like hey like I, I know it's kind of like a, a dick Low thing. Key, this is very dangerous. Yeah, very dangerous. But I'm telling her, like, listen, and she's she's always good uh, with these type of things because I try to keep it pretty realistic. I'm not trying to be a, a dick towards them, you know. But I'm also mm-hmm. not going to pull my punches if they're doing something crazy. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, they have 24 hours to get you or he's going to feed you to Tiamat. Uh, so, Lovely. yep, the players were like, we have no idea where she's at. The 24 hours were up, and she unfortunately perished without them knowing because they're not there to see it happening. Exactly. She was a prisoner. So she was out of the game for a couple sessions but came back as an NPC, a new character that she had. And the NPC was actually someone who had, like, defected from Archon's group and had witnessed that happen. And they were, like, was close to the young Aragonasi character so was trying to comfort her in her last moments right. and then she had like a letter which was like the other character trying to communicate to the characters oh, like man. like a goodbye so that's one they got the letter and were like what the heck is this they were all happy like we're gonna go get her it was like a big moment of oh she's dead like we couldn't save our teenage uh, companion you know someone that we've been yeah. playing this game in for two years who like brought life to the party so she's gone but she also left the like this was something that she wrote as well so she had given it to my wife's character and then my wife it, w- it was an email so she read it in front of everybody and oh, that's man. when she, she broke down crying because it was like a goodbye specifically to all of them and how she right. wanted them to how she was proud of them uh for, for having grown over yeah. the last two years and it was kind of very touching because it's true like all the characters like two years playing a game they're not the same characters yeah, either 100 percent. you yeah. can't help but put yourself into it you yeah. can't help it yep and yeah. it 
it ties back to something I was saying earlier, how like that character is a portion of Haley, you know, no matter how different or chaotic you make a character, there's a little bit of you in them. So we lost that piece of that player, someone who we'd grown with. And my wife was in tears, man. All the, all the, there was guys, cause it's, it's two, the two ladies, myself, and then we have two other guys. They were in tears. Uh, we had never met her in person. So this is like how close we'd gotten, you know, oh, yeah. it, we just couldn't imagine. And like they, they lost her, man. And it was just a big emotional moment. And that's something that like has stuck with me uh, to this day. It's something that we've had tons of moment like t moments like this, but that was like a, a really big one that they, they realized they're like, Oh, uh, wasn't expecting that. And also wasn't expecting to feel that way. You know, it's made up. We didn't, but to them, it was like they lost someone, you know, and it was so abrupt and so jarring and that that's the only uh, form of expression that they, they, they could show then. Yeah, I mean, it's brilliant. I mean, I think, you know, for Haley, it's interesting, too. It's like she's really young in the yeah. concept of sacrifice for someone who's young. When you're young, what do you usually think? Oh, I'm going to live a really long time. Oftentimes, although the younger generation, sadly, mm -hmm. might be di a little bit different, but all of a sudden she's putting the saying, well, if I cut my young life short, I save all these people I've just bonded with and gone through quite literally hell with, right? Yeah. Um, through the fire and brimstone, in this case, quite literally, right? Yeah. So for her, even through that death, I'm sure uh, she grew a great deal, right? And everyone else who is like, listen, this is, you know, it's our job to protect, it's our job to care for, it's our job to nurture, to lose that, right? That sense of loss, like it helps you appreciate the next set of opportunities that you get, right? Yeah. And forces you or conditions you to help uh, accept that feeling moving forward and maybe get better at it and make yourself maybe more complete. Um, I think it's, it's, it's such a wonderful story. And I think the Forgotten Realms, and I know, I mean, again, I, I made my own system, but I'm, I'm a sucker. I grew up on the Forgotten Realms in some respects with Baldur's Gate. Um, the reason why I think so my actually low key, my favorite genre is actually historical fiction. Oh, I do a lot of what you do where I basically take the party who they are. And then I take as much accurate, genuine, real history that I possibly can. And I marry them. And I think basically what you did is exactly that, but just in the forgotten realms, mm -hmm. right? Like yeah. literally it's the same application of a historical fiction process in the forgotten realms, which is so rich, but that's a great story. Uh, I'm glad to hear that it's been going so long. It's so rare to, to have, you know, that camaraderie, you know, um, and I think tabletop is really, if you have the right chemistry, man, I, I, I mean, you'll hear this, like you'll see people on the store together crew and, you know, people we played with for a long time. Like just, you're playing stories with me. Huh? You don't have a choice. So I'm going to show yeah. up your house. Like, you know, it's just kind of one of those things. I'm just, uh, I love the story, Frank. Thanks for sharing. For sure. Yeah, of course. Do you have something that's like equally jarring or something that's stuck with you? Like from, from games or. Sure. I mean, you know, I've been doing this for, for a while. I think, oh man, I'll, I'll, let's see. I'll stick to, 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 to forgotten realms just to keep all things equal. <laughs> um, there was a moment where, so um, d during the pandemic, um, mm. so my son was born in the late February of 2020, and oh. all of a sudden, a few weeks later, the world changed, and so our lives became pretty hard, at least for us. I don't, I mean, I'm, I'm sure compared to many, it was easy, but for me, I'll just speak for myself, it became pretty hard, you know, in the isolation. So I was like, I need that creative outlet, I need this bond. So I started a story called Stolen Sunrise, uh, set in the Forgotten Realms, um, which is basically the story. I'm not sure, like, again, I don't want to assume people's familiarity with Forgotten Realms, but there was a time in the Forgotten Realms called the Time of Troubles where the over god kicked all the gods out because they weren't basically doing their jobs. And in this case, um, two, two gods, uh, Lathander and Shar, fell in love, which is a rather large taboo if you know that world. And Ea was like, yeah, no, and essentially created this curse where the shadow fell, bled into the material world, and vice versa, which would destroy both realms until... Um, basically, it was a test of, of folks in the realms in any event. Um, my dad played a character. A, um, I don't know if you know who Ilmater is, but he was a cleric of Ilmater. Okay. Ilmater is like the Jesus Christ, in my opinion, of, of Forgotten Realms. Um, I think I have heard it. Cause it, it, it. Is he part of like the 
is he the triad with like Tyr and exactly? He's the self-sacrificial the man of the poor. If you yeah. look at him, he's all raggedy and he's all bloodied up and yeah. cut because of his sacri sacrifice on behalf of the common people. Um, so he was a cleric of Illmater, and there was a scene where we basically found the um, through a great deal of strife, the, basically the great library of the Forgotten Realms, which was part of one of the ancient lost Elven empires, and there was. Um, they were tricked into finding a truth at the end of the library that would further the aims of the antagonist. Um, but during that process, an angel, as a matter of fact, you know, um, what's the lady, the fallen angel who leads Avernus canonically? Uh, Zar sister, Zariel. Zariel's sister is actually still an angel, and I, or I invented her, and she confronts my dad's character basically in front of this giant pit at the end of this uh, library that goes into nothingness and uh, essentially um, the angel it needs to purge her sister <laughs> and, and save her sister but essentially what we were doing there and it's hard to explain um, was use this mystery to stop this curse from spreading for yeah. lack of a better word so there's a really <laughs> significant conflict and my dad's character through everything we had went through was forced to fight this angel um, and she kind of cheats and then essentially like not Sparta kicks him, but kind of kicks him into the abyss and he dies. He dies oh. in that, he dies in that moment. But as he's falling into nothingness and his spirit is kind of rejoining the river of life, Illmater himself, who, because you know, clerics when they hit level 20, they can talk to their God. Mm -hmm. Um, so my dad, we had reached level 20 by this point, um, and had, finally communed with Ilmater. Ilmater had dubbed him. So Ilmater's kind of like, um, you know, in Princess Bride, the Dread Pirate Roberts, I made it so that Ilmater actually is a Dread Pirate Roberts situation okay. where it gets passed to the Chosen who's worthy of that role so that all the burdens that they're carrying, like Atlas, they can just go on and, and, like into the beyond, right? So Ilmater, to save my dad, gives him the title of Illmater to bring him back to life as a god, but only after he sacrificed, like, and it's very, actually, it's a very similar sacrificial, sacrifices life to give us the chance to stop the curse from spreading. But in that moment, like, you have to narrate your dad's character's death, right? Because in reality, he did, in fact, lose and, and pass away, but, you know, he, he came back. Um, it's a, it's not quite deus ex because that was always meant to be because my dad had kind of earned that, right? Yeah. Um, but it was a really beautiful scene. I remember tearing up when I was talking about it because, you know, it, it's hard to describe just for, for the audience, but so much goes into these little moments of story, like between you and all of the group who like couldn't, they couldn't quite be there to save him. And as he's falling into the abyss, they get there. And this angel who desperately wants to be good has just committed a deeply evil act like her sister and then all of a sudden and then my dad you know the reaction where he becomes ill mater it's like this intensely profound experience come you know as people are starting to get you know come out of covid and he gets this this moment of not redemption but almost like the culmination of a journey that he mm -hmm. felt like he wasn't worthy of but in reality was i mean it was just it was just beautiful man it was just beautiful um it just it's hard it's it's hard to kind of fully give the power of that but there's so many from from that that story i love stolen sunrise stolen sunrise meant made a great deal to me it was uh it was a wonderful story i i, I definitely took like almost the antithesis of like your theory like oh low stakes like it was like the highest possible stakes. yeah yeah you know, yeah because like, yeah, like, like low stakes yeah it's fun to, to relax but high stakes and when you overcome it you it's right. the, the power you feel of overcoming something that crazy like just gods and angels and everything you just feel so crazy powerful and like so good and there's just nothing like it like yeah and you have to earn the build up right like I, yeah like, what, yeah what i was just starting out one of my weaknesses is i wanted that feeling so bad because i mm -hmm. in my life i had to overcome a lot and it almost became like an addiction like you have to play in the super bowl what is that feeling and what does that adrenaline feel like yeah. what is that 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 team bonding and, and winning like i needed that and so like i would i would rush that but as i grew older and more experienced and mature as a gm it's like really earning those moments um of payoff are what define the payoff mm -hmm. right and that that is important in and of itself and i'm sure in, in your stories franco you've 
you probably made similar mistakes. Maybe you didn't, but I definitely made, I'll speak for myself, I made those mistakes in, in growing up as a GM, but it sounds like you grew up super fast which is just really impressive in terms of your capacity to do it you got it like low-key you know after this airs you got to bring me in as a guest now i want in like just like i gotta dap up Haley virtually like hey Haley, heard you're a hero <laughs> yeah yeah but definitely uh do that uh my thing with it you brought up like a deus ex uh months later when we're wrapping this up mm -hmm. i don't know how familiar you are with the story but the uh essentially a, a lawful good character has the opportunity to grab Sariel's sword mm -hmm. and like become super powerful. The way it was phrased in the book was whoever wields this sword loses themselves. Mm -hmm. And it's very ambiguous in how it's worded. Oh, this is spoiler alerts for anybody who hasn't uh, played <laughs> this through yet. Yeah. Spoiler alerts. Uh, it implies that they then become like an angel, but they all understood it as you're going to die if you take this sword. Like, you're going to you grab the sword. Like Zario, exactly. Right? Like, you're yeah, going to yeah, lose yeah. yourself. It's going to be something bad. And the way that, and she was a cleric as well, the way she interpreted it was, all right, like, I'm going to get this surge of power. You guys are going to lose me. She was like, I'm going to lose my character, but I'm going to do it to bring the other one back. And nobody was expecting this. Haley was already playing another character. And they were like, what are you doing? Like, don't kill yourself to bring her back. He's like, no. she's like, no, like, this is the reason why I came down here. And it was like another emotional moment. Mm. She turned into an angel, didn't die, brought the other one back. Because everybody, you know, her God, she, her tear was like, you know, what? we're going to pull some strings. Yeah. Uh, just for the RP I of it. Yeah, like the RP of it, I'm like, yeah, you guys totally deserve this because you've been through enough. So like getting her back after like losing her and everything and oh, it was another emotional moment. Uh, not something I was planning on doing, but it felt appropriate and like, I don't know. They were just ready to go and determine and they kicked some butt and it was fantastic. It. Yeah. It just seems, so the stories I feel like you know, in Forgotten Realms, the ones that you've said so far are not low stakes. And yet the one, the products that you're developing, <laughs> yeah. aren't necessarily, it's almost like there's this divide. Like, what's the deal with that? Like, help me out. Help me understand that. Like, what's it, going on there? You, you need both, you know. You need true that, true that, true that. You need both. Um, my, I'm going to keep talking about my wife. Yeah. That's my okay. wife, she's, like yeah, yeah. She's, uh, she's big into books as well. She's mm. read 40 books this year. All nice fantasy books sci-fi books murder mysteries everything she reads everything she's constantly reading at night stays up reading and something that she's brought up is she's dabbling like these low stake books like there's something i forgot what it's called something in lattes it's like this high fantasy mm. world where like i think like this orc couple run like a coffee shop that's and how, she wasn't like an anime yeah you know? yeah exactly oh she loves it she loves anime too and she loves like slice of life low yep. stake anime i don't know why like there's little escapism there but there's something there's i guess there's a comfort, comfort. in knowing that other people comfort, are comfortable yeah. yeah yeah uh like knowing what is coming you know no world ending thing just, i guess like a consistency type thing that's a new genre that she's exploring and she really likes it and there seems to be uh a light for that right now because that one book oh, that i just mentioned yeah people are like loving it like just having that calm zen deep sigh moment of like okay like everything's fine in the world uh just kind of seeps through the book into their life and i think that's what's going on there so yeah yeah uh, you need both you need you gotta kick some demon butts and <laughs> kick some angel butts and then also experience uh, some some relaxing some relaxing things I love it. So last question I'm going to ask you, Franco. So sure. if, if, and I, I've been asking this to everybody so far, if you kind of had your way and can kind of, and this is dangerous, like deck of many things, pull the, uh, I can do what I want card, like over the next five years with the things that you're doing, um, you know, and again, I know it's not a business technically, but let's yeah. call it, um, your, your endeavors, like what would you want that to look like over the next five years? Like what's your ideal state? Like for the folks that are watching this, how can they spend that dream coming to life for you what would that look like goodness i think oh whew, that's so good because i'm dabbling in so many things there's th three things i'm working on it's 
those TTRPGs that I'm putting through my itch.io page, mm -hmm, so it'd be like mm -hmm. Games Franco, um, I made it my goal, and I'm putting in effort and like money out of pocket because uh, this isn't my full-time job, so I have a job, and I want to make these as accessible as possible. These first two have been free. People mm -hmm. have been gracious enough to donate anyways. It's not needed. Um, if anything gets too pricey, maybe like a dollar, but that's where I want to keep it because mm -hmm. I'd rather people play something fun that's readily available for them without having to drop money. Um, them enjoying it and the comments that I get mean more to me than five bucks ten bucks i don't like i don't need the money you know like i want you guys to be happy and enjoy that experience there's something just so rewarding about that like i can't imagine writing a D, &D story like descent into avernus and only think about the money like the stories that come out of it and knowing that other people are doing that that would just mean the world to me so that's that's one thing um I, that'd be the main thing i think becoming like a side hustle uh a side hustle dm uh there's like these websites that let you like dm virtually so i might hop on and volunteer to run games for strangers online that don't have access to games i feel like right. there's a shortage of dms and i just want to volunteer my time uh I, actually those would be like the the top two things just keep an eye on the the itch page for free or very cheap content and then uh hopefully being able to help people out in, in running D and D games. I think that that'd be fun. That'd be a fun thing. Well we'll definitely have the link down here for the, the itch page for sure. But let me admit that I just lied and ask you one last follow up question. <laughs> yes. If if you received enough support would you want to do this full time or is this more like this is it's 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 a balanced for you right now compartmentalized in the side or is this something like finances if they somehow magically came true <laughs> would this be something that you want to do as a full time uh profession i i thought about this a lot um i and it's a hard answer because Right away, you think, yeah, I want to do this full time. I do want to do this full time. But what we've found, speaking to my wife, my wife has started business based on hobbies and stuff like that. Once something, once a hobby becomes like a business and it sucks the fun out of it, I want to mm. keep it, I want to keep it right in the spot where it doesn't lose the fun, you know? Okay. Uh, if I'm staying up 23 hours, I mean, I can't see myself being upset about that, creating the game. So, yeah, it, It'd be fantastic if it was like a full-time job. I can't see myself getting tired of this, but I also don't want to make it something that is no longer fun for me. You know, when totally get it. when it's more of a burden than fun, then it's it's lost the magic. You know, yep. it's it's I don't yep. want it to be. All right, I gotta crank these out so I can make this money, so I can pay yep. these people. I I want to make it because it's fun for me and fun for everybody else. And that sounds like the cheesy goody two shoes answer but it's true like when it, when a hobby isn't a hobby anymore and it becomes a job a job is a job and when people are like oh make you know you don't what is it you, you if you make what you love your job you don't work a day Kaizen, and you know, right? yeah That's yeah like the whole the thing of all those important things and it's like a job still has there's heart there's going to be hardships and there's going to be things and well, i guess to wrap it all up, I think I would say yes because I can't see a hardship being too much for you know I don't see a burden big enough to turn me away from this hobby. That would be my final answer. All right. Well, I think that's <laughs> an extremely fair, uh, thoughtful final answer, Franco. I mean, I've obviously wrestled wrestled with that as well, but I think mm. it's like when you kind of try to live a purpose driven life, um, you kind of have to wrestle with that r inevitable result anyway, because we live yeah. in a capitalist society and it's just part of the game. Yeah. If you want to be able to expose people to this sort of genuine positivity and things that will actually help them in their life, or to, frankly, they'll just pass time and enjoy the worst case scenario. It's like, this is just kind of part and parcel. And if you can compartmentalize away from the creativity, I'll share just a, before we adjourn and I, you probably have to run, but we so Good. with that actual play show I, I talked to you about called One Giant Leap, um, we had a reunion show uh, this past Sunday, and we filmed that 
like my wife gave birth to our son four days after the last episode. That's oh how close we cut it right before COVID. Yeah. And so with all these editing nightmares, we finally finished it and I wanted to film uh, before we kind of start the social media blitz or whatever. I wanted people to come together and like honor that experience. And we built the studio in my living room and it was just like this sense where everything that led up to that moment was the work but now we're sitting and looking at each other's smiling faces this is the fun and when you learn to kind of compartmentalize and be able to live in the moment now i can be have be creative now i can enjoy this moment that has it like me talking to you i had to put together these lights and cameras i gotta upload this and the videographer and i are gonna talk about it edit it and post it and who to tag and that's just part of it but like the conversation yeah. and living in the moment something i think obviously you do super 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 high level um that that's really it so i would encourage you i think my gut feeling is that people are going to find you people are going to appreciate you and um that may may not become an option i'm not you know nostradamus but yeah. i hope it does genuinely uh for you franco for sure yeah uh, i'm not just saying that because i want to sit in on one of your games i'm saying that because i believe it okay just yeah so you know I, would, I appreciate it, man. Cause, I uh, bought a lot of Franco stock. How about that? <laughs> I, I really appreciate it because, you know, sometimes you – I'm sure you've gone through this where, you're like, you start doubting. You're like, man, is this really, like, worth it or, like, are people going to enjoy any of this? And it, it's always good, you know, to just hear that, that someone does kind of believe in what you uh, are passionate about. Um, like you said earlier, like your email – my email reaching out to you kind of, like, sparked week, joy. Man. Yeah, man. So – uh, just having that reciprocated, it, it's, it's huge. It's, it's, it's huge. Yeah. We got to support each other. That's part of why this show exists mm -hmm. is just to be able to talk it out and, and, and shed light on people that like genuinely deserve that spotlight. I may or may not be able to provide it. Three people might watch this show. Three million might. I have no idea. The point is, is again, just doing what we feel is right and putting yourself out there. Naruto style, you know, it's my ninja way, so to speak. Yeah. Like, go for, do the right thing regardless. But, uh, Anyway, Franco, uh, I genuinely really appreciate the time. Best of luck with uh, everything that you have going on. 100% hit me up, invite me in, uh, and yeah. um, we'll talk soon, okay? Sounds great, man. Take it easy. Uh